So I'm going to talk about the Swiss e-waste recycling scheme today. And what is quite fascinating is that this um, system has been in place for a good 25 years. And so just a little bit about Switzerland, which, um, as Rose said, a small country with lots of mountains <laughs> in the middle of Europe. Um, Switzerland has a population of 8.4 million. It's got 26 states. The capital is Bern, which, um, yeah, no, that's not really, yeah, about where the middle is of that circle. Um, it's a federal republic, and although geographically a part of Europe, it's not a member of the European Union. And just for reference, I've put the exchange rate between the Swiss franc and the Australian dollar. This is from about two, three weeks back, um, as there's going to be a couple prices in uh, Swiss francs that I'm going to mention. So this is a graph showing for 2016 the materials recycled in Switzerland. You can see that there's about 3 million tons of materials that were collected for recycling, and the majority of this was paper and cardboard and also green waste. Glass, textiles, tin-plated cans, and al aluminium Aluminium cans, PET, plastic, and batteries are also part of this, and um, about 138,000 tons of e-waste. This is 4.3% uh, of the total amount. I did see a number for Victoria for 2015-16, when out of about 8.5 million um, tons of materials recycled, there was less than 0.1% of e-waste in total. So... How did all of this start in Switzerland? Switzerland for household waste has a user pays principle in most areas. So household waste is mostly collected in bags. There are some areas where there's bins. And the disposal fee is included. So if you buy a roll of garbage bags, there is a price um, on that that allows you to have that then collected. And you can see as an example, there's one Swiss, Swiss franc 20 that you need to pay for a 17 liter volume bag and the um, photo that's for the town of Basel, that's, these are their waste bags. This was first introduced in Switzerland in 1975 in St. Gallen and it does apply in most towns, however it is not nationwide. And um, yeah, this also leads us to the next item, waste in Switzerland is dealt with as a, at a municipal level, similar to Australia. And so what this means for e-waste, that initially the consumer had to pay for e-waste to be taken back. And this has then led to an initiative by the six largest importers of IT and copying machines in the early 1990s, together with the Swiss Foundation for Consumer Protection and also the Federal Office for the Environment. They decided that they want to establish an e-waste take-back and recycling scheme. And they... Um, tasked the uh, SWICO, which is the Swiss Economic Association for the Suppliers of Information, Communication and Organizational Technology, to implement such a scheme. And that then resulted in a national, independent, not-for-profit system to facilitate and finance the orderly take-back, dismantling and recycling of electrical and electronic equipment. This is just a graph showing kind of how it all is linked together. So we've got the consumer, we've got the retailers, manufacturers, and then there's the take back or collection points. There's of course logistics involved with mainly transport between collection points and the recycling companies. And in Switzerland there's three different organizations that do run the scheme. This is um, due to historical reasons how the scheme was first established. Um, we've got Swico Recycling, which is a not-for-profit system founded in 1993, and they operate in the area of informatics, consumer electronics, office, communications, graphics industry, and also measurement and medical technology. They started with six members, so these were those six IT and copy machine um, who got together, and nowadays they've got 500 companies that have signed a convention and with that pledge that they'll work under the scheme. The other um, organization is SENSE, or it's an uh, official brand name, SENSE E-Recycling, 
also a not-for-profit organization, was founded in September 1995, and this covers all the electrical and electronic household appliances. This scheme has 700 contract partners, and that includes retailers, manufacturers, and importers. There is, of course, an overlap, so I mean, a lot of companies, a lot of retailers are members of both schemes, as they do um, cater for both these markets. And the last one, which is um, also how this scheme was um, introduced, or how the, let's say, regulation behind it was changed, um, in 2004, there was a revision of the regulation behind the scheme, and that asked for lamps and illuminants, um, light-saving bulbs to be included, and that's when the Stiftung Lichtrecycling Schweiz was um, founded, and they have 330 retailers, manufacturers, and importers that do participate in the system. Um, the sale of regular incandescent light bulbs is prohibited to households since 2012, as it is in many other countries, and including Australia. Um, nowadays, only shockproof bulbs can be sold, and only to uh, the industry and commerce, but there's a bit of a loophole, um, especially online. People can still buy these bulbs, unfortunately. So, in addition to all the... Um, retailers and importers. The scheme also has 20 companies in Switzerland and under the scheme they're licensed to do the actual recycling, so the dismantling and the separation of different materials. There's two companies that are specifically licensed for photovoltaic systems and out of this scheme, together with all the other recycling of the glass and of the textiles and of the um, aluminium and all these things, a new profession has emerged. At this time, there's about 100 people who do a three years apprenticeship to become a recyclist. And in particular, the recycling businesses who do the early staging of the dismantling of the equipment, they provide employment for more than 1,000 people with either social or, uh, and or physical handicaps. So these can be people who need help with work reintegration or people who work in a sheltered workshop. So this is a bit of detail for what is covered under the scheme. So we've got all the electronic entertainment equipment. We've got office, information, communications and technology equipment, refrigeration, so that's fridges, freezers, air conditioners, household appliances, and that's the large and small ones, so your dishwasher, your washing machine, but also handheld appliances, power tools, excluding large-scale stationary industrial tools, and then also your um, electrically or battery-powered sport and leisure equipment and toys. I've got two little boys, and it's amazing how many toys we have that have a battery. And even with using the rechargeable ones, they always run out of battery. <laughs> And the last group, that's the luminaires and lighting control equipment, which are also included under the scheme. So, as I said, there's a large number of collection points, so all the members of any of those schemes or of any of these organizations, if it's the Sense for households or if it's the SWICOM or for commercial uh, companies, all those members, there are collection points. And in addition, there's other companies who can become collection points, they have to undergo a stringent approval process. They have to show that they have the space to store the materials and that it's safe to store them. So, what, what, yeah, the scheme obviously doesn't want people to just have it somewhere at the back and then somebody comes and grabs some or whatever. And um, just with the member companies, there's at least over a thousand collection points. I couldn't find a number for it. But um, there is from um, Swiss Recycling, they've got a web page where people can put in the postcode and then it just gives them all the different collection points in their area. This can be done specifically for one uh, item or it can be done just for anything that can be collected through recycling. So what or who pays for this? And this now comes to the advanced recycling fee, which is something that was... Um, included in the system right from the beginning. It is a voluntary fee. At this stage, there's no re regulation that asks for the fee to be collected. However, all the companies who do work or um, yeah, operate under the scheme, they have to 
um, impose that fee on all their electrical and electronic equipment that they sell in Switzerland and also Liechtenstein, which is a small country between Switzerland and Austria. Wholesalers and retailers then charge this fee to the consumers and as a result of paying the ARF, the end consumer is entitled to return the equipment free of charge. Any equipment can be brought back in a store that sells similar things. So you cannot go and bring your dishwasher to a store that only sells mobile phones, but if a store has a similar range of um, equipment, you can bring it back. You do not have to buy something new, and it's not so that you have to go back to the store where you bought it. And I find this particularly interesting at, um, at the beginning of the scheme. I mean, there would have been a lot of appliances that were bought before this came um, into operation, and people still could bring things back. So that's a, I think that's really an interesting point. And nowadays, all these three organizations financially are doing very well. So doesn't look like that's an issue. Um, what's not included is where people go to other countries or if things are bought online. So that at the moment is a little bit of a problem and estimates show that the scheme this way loses about two to three millions a year. Um, it is possible to do a voluntary contribution by a text message of five Swiss francs. And I could not find any numbers unfortunately. Um, yeah, it would be interesting to see how many people actually do this. So, why do people do it? Um, this is just a brief summary of the regulations that are behind the whole thing. What I'd like to point out is that when the scheme was first established in 1993, the actual ordinance did only come into force five years later. So the industry was really ahead of a regulation telling them you have to do this. And the ordinance on the return, taking back and disposal of electrical and electronic equipment, it does prescribe that the take back free of charge by retailers and manufacturers and importers has to be guaranteed. It also has the consumer's obligation to return the used equipment and it also includes uh, e-waste to landfill ban. In addition, the dismantling and separation for reuse needs to be completed by a licensed recycler. And then there are other um, regulatory controls such as the ordinance on movement of waste. The majority of the dismantling and reuse is done in Switzerland. Some processes such as, for example, the um, ferrous iron processing, it's just not a big enough market. So there's companies in other European countries and these materials they get exported under that uh, movement of waste ordinance. And a third one that is important for the scheme is the ordinance on the disclosure of prices. So retailers have to um, include the advanced recycling fee in their prices. When that first came into force in 2004 they also had to like publicly announce this. So in, in advertising material it had to say the ARF is included in the retail price. Um, nowadays, as people are kind of used to this, it's just like it has to be included so that you don't go and want to pay for something and then the retailer goes, oh, and please give me also the one Swiss franc extra for the ARF. Oh yeah, and I forgot to mention that. In terms of the costs, so the ARF is between Swiss, uh, between 10 Swiss cents and 28 Swiss francs, depending on the size and complexity. So a mobile phone or mobile phone accessories, they're 10 cents. Um, there's, for example, PCs that come about six Swiss francs. And then when you go to the things that have really large screens, so either television or um, computers with screens that are 70 inches or larger, that is uh, 28 Swiss francs. And the organization, or well, the, the, yeah, the scheme does, does adjust these prices, I think on an annual basis, where they just look into how much is happening, how much cost do we have, logistics and recycling. So, let's look at some numbers and facts. 
This is from the uh, annual report from 2017, and so this is materials collected in 2016. I should also point out Switzerland has a financial year that goes from January to December, so that's why it's not 1516, but just 16. The sense e-recycling, so that's all your household equipment that was taken back, they collected 37,000 tons of large household appliances, 18,000 tons of refrigeration appliances, 30,000 tons of small appliances, 1,000 tons of lighting equipment, almost 3,000 tons of lamps, and 126 tons of photovoltaic components. And the numbers below that, that's what was gained from this volume. So the majority is metals, um, almost 60% iron, and just as an example, 2,500 tons of copper and almost 2,000 tons of aluminium, which are around 2 or 2.8%. In terms of the financial side, Sensi Recycling um, had a revenue of 43 million from the advanced recycling fee of these materials collected in 2016. And let's look at the recycling streams or what comes out of the product in uh, this way. So as you can see here, the, maybe, yeah, the majority is the metals, so about 60% in total. Other waste, or well, sorry, I shouldn't say waste stream. Other recycling streams include plastic metal mixtures, plastics, cables, toner cartridges, circuit boards, LCDs, cathode ray tubes, glass, and other materials. And there's 1% of pollutants, and that 1% that includes batteries, condensers, components with mercury or broken glass, phosphorus, um, components with selenium coatings, components that include asbestos, chlorinated fluorocarbons, oil, or ammonia. So this is in the process of the recycling dealt with. And this one is in a very nice way showing how the scheme has been successful, I would say. The left-hand side, that's the numbers from 2000, and this is 2016. So you can see that it started, or not, it's not started, but 2000, there was about 40,000 tons recycled under the scheme. This has increased to a good 130,000 tons in 2016. And the different colors, that's just breaking it up between the blue is the large electrical appliances, then the yellow is refrigerators, and the others are the small electrical devices, electronic devices, the different shades of green. The lighting equipment is the smallest uh, portion of the entire scheme. and. Um, apparently there was also a number of devices um, collected that are actually not um, included in the ordinance. However, the ordinance on the take back is at the moment being revised and one of the um, reasons for this revision is that they want to bring it up to speed with current technology and current equipment that is being sold. Um, oh, sorry, very briefly. The one thing that was touched before by Spyro in terms of the data um, security, that's of course also an important thing that is um, considered in the scheme. Um, the contract partners, they're bound by their convention signature to protect data and devices that they collect. But in addition, the, the scheme also advertises, for example, softwares that people can use on their equipment to, um, to delete data. And for things that have high security requirements, for example in the finance sector or um, health sector, legal sector, there is uh, laws in place that actually dictate what, uh, what measures need to be taken to guarantee data security. So this one is just very briefly, and we've had a large number of talks already about Australia. Um, there is, of course, the National Waste Policy. There's the Product Stewardship Act, as we know, under revision at the moment. And under this kind of what does cover, to some degree, the similar range of products is the National Television and Computer Recycling Scheme, the disposal of mercury-containing lamps, and then, of course, um, organizations such as 
the Australian New Zealand Recycling Platform and Mobile Master. We heard quite a lot of detail about this one. So the, there is a lot of programs happening in Australia. There's a lot of e-waste collected and recycled. And in addition, there's also an Australian New Zealand standard that has the details about how it should all be done. And of course, more recently, the Victorian draft waste management policy waste, which will ban the e-waste from being disposed at landfill from the 1st of July in 2019. So in concluding, I would like to point out these four things. This is why I think the Swiss system is successful. The main one is really manufacturer responsibility. The scheme was started by the industry who does generate these products and ultimately this type of waste. And with the introduction of the advanced recycling fee, the scheme has a, has a method of being self-funding. It also, of course, does help that all the three organizations running it are not-for-profit organizations. The scheme is easy. People have many collection points in their area. So this, this results in active consumer participation. And apart from e-waste being banned from reaching landfill, it's also cheaper because as people have to pay for their rubbish bags or rubbish bins, you don't want to fill them up with e-waste if you can just drop it off somewhere. And then, of course, there are the regulatory controls in place to make it all happen. This is a slide just showing my information sources for this presentation. And um, thank you for your attention. <laughs>